Hey everybody, this is Josh McKinney, and I just want to welcome you to episode 157 of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. So this one, honestly, I, I feel like it has nothing to do with Jiu-Jitsu. I, I guess I try to, to bring it back around at the very end, talk a little bit of Jiu-Jitsu for you guys. But if you're looking for a very Jiu-Jitsu episode, this isn't it. If you're looking for an episode of a podcast of a guy that you kind of like that sometimes has some cool things to say about jujitsu where he just tells crazy funny stories from his childhood then this might be the episode for you uh that's pretty much the only that's the best disclaimer that i can go with on this one is that this episode really doesn't have to do with jujitsu uh, i try to make it a little bit because Anything I talk about eventually has to do with jujitsu, uh, but uh, yeah, this this episode pretty much just has to do with me talking about childhood trauma and uh, yeah, in in a really really funny light, uh, or at least I thought it was funny. Um, maybe you guys won't. Maybe it just falls. What's weird about doing a podcast? This is why I would never ever say that. I do a comedy podcast uh, and people will say that people will be like, Oh my gosh, the podcast is hilarious. I don't really think of it as that because you don't know if something is going to translate from it being funny in my office in Granite city, Illinois to your car in Atlanta, Georgia, right? I don't know if it's going to translate. I don't know if you guys are going to think it's funny or if you guys are going to be like, this is the worst episode that I have ever heard. But, who cares if it is you know what we got we had like 150 good ones and and one really bad one uh but if it is funny if you guys liked the all the random stories i tell that really don't have anything to do with jujitsu let me know i don't i definitely would never make it a real segment but it might be something fun to do every once in a while because i have so many great really non jujitsu related stories kind of jujitsu related stories like that have to do with travel um that i should be telling you guys and i just never do and so uh yeah if you guys like that let me know send me an email josh at simplifyingjujitsu.com or a message on instagram at the josh mckinney of course if you guys uh, are enjoying the show give me that five star review i wanted to hit you with that before the episode started just in case just in case the episode sucks and you're like, ah, oh, man, this dude's asking for a review in the middle of this garbage. He's getting a one star review. I would hate that. And so I'll ask you now for the five star review. Without further ado, I'll stop stalling and we'll get into the episode. Here it is. All right, so I don't really know where this episode's going to go. I've been planning on like the working title of this has been story time. Uh, yeah, there's a working title to episodes now. I actually think about the episode more than 10 seconds before I start recording sometimes. Uh, we're moving up in the world, right? Um, but yeah, I just have some stories I wrote down. I just thought uh, we always do serious stuff. We're always so serious about everything on the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show, right? That's what people always, that's the big complaint. It's like, I wish that the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show would be just a little more on the nose, have a little more humor in it. That's what people always tell me. Say, you guys are just so uptight. You're so serious and you always are <laughs> so prepared. And it even shows in this rant you're on right now, Josh. But anyway, let's get back to some of these stories. I don't know. I just wanted to tell you guys some stories from my childhood. This show feels like, feels like uh, maybe like therapy for me a lot of times. So, uh, you know, I'm going, getting ready to go on family vacation. I'm actually on family vacation right now, uh, getting ready to come home uh, when this episode airs, but I'm getting ready. I'm in that mindset thinking about all these different fun experiences I've had with my family and thought I would just share some because I'm sure that as I tell these stories, we're going to find a way to make them jujitsu related. And if not, I can't guarantee that, but I can guarantee that you'll laugh 
in this episode. I guarantee that this episode, you'll finally get a funny episode of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. And so, uh, and the reason I know this is because I take a lot of road trips and I try these stories out on road trips before I ever even think about telling them to you guys. And so uh, these always get some really good laughs. Uh, my first one, and this is pretty much where any trauma in my life started. Um, you know, not that hopefully this doesn't spoil the story for you. But uh, when I was seven years old, uh, I've been going to, you know, big boy school now for like two years, I think I'm in second grade. And uh, what's cool about the school that I get to go to is I am the same school as my brother and my cousin, who are both seven years older than me or six years older than me. Uh, but we all get to kind of be around each other in school. And so it was a really fun experience because they are who I grew up with most of the time was my brother and my cousin. And uh, my cousin uh, is a girl, not that, that matters in the story, but I just thought you guys needed a little more context. She also has red hair. I don't know if that is helpful to you. She doesn't look Asian like me. She's on the white side of the family. Sorry, giving you guys too many, too many details. But anyway, back to the story. Uh, so as I'm growing up, I'm, I'm seven years old. Nothing really bad has happened to me at this point. My life is pretty good. Until one Wednesday afternoon. One Wednesday, we get off school. And understand, Wednesday was the day that we would go to my cousin Kristen's house. Uh, we would either go to our house and uh, stay there, or we would go to our cousin's house. And so that's kind of how our parents balanced us you know, having kids. They uh, they relied on, on uh, my dad and his brother relied on each other. And so uh, then we all went to school together. It just was perfect. It was a great scenario. We actually all lived on the same block. It was really great all the way up until this point. So we're at my cousin Kristen's house. My cousin Kristen just got a new parakeet. And when I say new parakeet, it's not like she got a baby parakeet. This was like a full grown man parakeet. Okay. His name was Clyde. So I really wasn't into the whole bird thing. I knew relatively quickly, like, Hey, this isn't a dog. This is different. You know, he doesn't seem to respond. He just kind of like talks to you and mocks you a bunch. Uh, I'm really not into it, really not loving it. My brother and my cousin, they're in charge at this point. And so if I'm seven, they're 13. And uh, they are like, Josh, you got to let Clyde like stand on your wrist. And I was like, I don't want to do that. I'm like, no, 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 this is a good idea. You got to let Clyde stand on your wrist. It'd be so cool. I'm like, oh, it'd be cool. Well, I'm trying to be cool. I mean, I want to be, I want to be cool. And so I, I let Clyde stand on my wrist. So while he's standing there, he takes a few steps up my forearm. I said, hey, I'm over this. Let's not do this anymore. Please take Clyde. And they're like, oh, no, he's fine. He just wants to stand on your shoulder, you know, like a pirate. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not buying that. I'm over this. I don't feel cool. I don't like what's happening. I'm over dealing with Clyde right now. Well, Clyde continues to walk up my arm. My brother and my cousin, they couldn't care less. They're excited about it. They're like, oh my gosh, you're finally going to be a pirate. And they, they let him get on my shoulder. I say, please get him off. I think he's going to bite me. And uh, pretty much right then he bit me. He bit me on my earlobe. And not only did he bite me on my earlobe, it wasn't like I was just, he like pecked me and I was being a baby. I like, Oh my gosh, get him off me. I was being a baby. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but he like bit, he latched on. He was like, he turned into like a dog. He wouldn't, he was shaking my earlobe. He was trying to pull it off my head. It was horrific, right? A terrible, terrible thing to happen. And there are really, I think there are two main lessons to take from this. First, this was a time that I learned I should probably trust my instincts. I knew letting that bird on my wrist was a bad idea. I knew letting him walk up my arm. I knew he was going to bite me. I, he was on my shoulder. I could feel it. He was going to bite me. Should have trusted my instincts on it. From then on out, after about you know seven and 53 days old, I decided seven years and 53 days old, I decided, hey, 
it's about time for me to uh, start trusting myself over these people. Uh, And then the second lesson that I learned is never let my brother and cousin watch your kid. Hey guys, Josh McKinney here. Just wanted to interrupt my crazy ramblings really quick and ask you for a huge favor. If you guys are finding um, these stories fun or funny, uh, or if you just find the podcast helpful, uh, I know a lot of the episodes are a little more educational than this, but if you are enjoying the content that I put out for absolutely free, need I remind you, uh, please give me a review or give me a a like and a comment. Uh, This is probably one of the most helpful things that you can do for a podcast. And this podcast is growing right now because so many of you guys have given a five-star review. And so please, please, please give me a five-star review. Let's get back to the episode. Uh, still to this day, I don't have kids, but I don't think I'm letting either of those guys watch them when I do have kids. I have a ton of stories about one time. This has nothing to do with, I wasn't even going to tell this story. One time, my brother, probably about the same age, convinced me that we were going to play a game. And he said, so uh, here's how this game worked. We had a bunch, my brother's in uh, Taekwondo. So we had like a bunch of different Taekwondo belts at our house. He said, um, you and Kristen are going to tie me up and you guys are going to time how long it takes me to escape. And we're like, okay, that's a great idea. This is, I love this idea. And so we tied this dude up. He escapes in like 30 seconds, right? I really wasn't very good at tying people up. Didn't really know how to do it. And my cousin was in on this. I find out later. So then it's my turn to get tied up. And they're like, hey, so we're going to tie you up with these belts. What they end up doing, we have a, we have bunk beds. They end up using the four posts of the bunk beds and they take belts and tie my ankle around two of the poles and then to my wrist. Okay. So my ankle is tethered to my wrist by, you know, you can, if it will help you think of these as jujitsu belts and not taekwondo belts. Maybe that's ruining the story for you, but if it'll help you think, think jujitsu belts. So I, then every time I reach for like one side, when I reach with my hand, my leg gets pulled by the belt. Uh, and so I'm totally trapped there. And then to add insult to injury, and this is totally true. Every story that I'm telling you guys, I really don't even think I need to exaggerate these uh, because they're they're just great stories. Uh, my brother and cousin then needed a way to like, you know, keep my parents from knowing that I am now tied up in our bedroom and crying and screaming. So what they did was they turned on gospel music really, really loud. They found a gospel stage. I don't know why my parents didn't think like, hey, these kids have never showed any interest in gospel music before. Maybe there's something going on. But then what's really funny about this story is they left me there for a while, for like 45 minutes, probably. There's debate, right? In my mind, it was 45 minutes. It was about, you know, it was about 15 gospel songs. You know, they're about three minutes each, so somewhere in the 12 to 15 range. My brother and cousin who were outside playing basketball claim it was 15 minutes. Regardless, it was a long time. Uh, but yeah, that's just a... That's just to to uh, defame the character of my brother and cousin a little more. Uh, that's just why I told you guys that story. So here's another great story. These are all childhood stories. I didn't even think about that. This was just me randomly talking about only my childhood. I thought I was going to put none of these are even jujitsu stories. Shoot. Didn't even think about that. All right. This is a good one, though. So I'm sure this is an experience that other people have. Uh, when I was a kid. Again, probably in the same age range, man, most of the trauma happened at that like seven to eight year mark. And uh, yeah, this was for me, this was more traumatic than the Clyde biting my ear off thing or even getting tied up and in, in left by my brother and cousin. I was a tough kid. They beat me up all the time. That's, you know, that's probably why I'm good at jujitsu now. Uh, I got to be thankful for that. Right. Uh, but anyway, 
So I thought I would tell this one since it is almost Halloween. Uh, so this is like, maybe I'll call this episode the Halloween spooktacular because I'm going to tell this like three minute story about trick or treating. But anyway, uh, I am a kid and I am trick or treating. And I, I am, of course, dressed up as a ninja as I was every year, as I did from five to 14 years old. I dressed up as a ninja, right? I have martial artists in my blood. I don't know. Just what I, I thought that like, hey, why wouldn't everybody dress up as a ninja for Halloween? It doesn't even make sense. Why are you why are you dressed like Elmo, dude? You could be a ninja with a plastic sword that you then get to keep for a period of time until you know it bends and breaks, which takes like three days because you're a maniac kid and you're trying to chop everything up with your plastic sword. But uh yeah, why in the heck would you not be a ninja for Halloween? Honestly, if I dress up this year. For Halloween, I'll be a ninja. Best thing you can be. But anyway, I'm a ninja. But just on the outside, I'm not a ninja in my heart yet. Like I, I am now. And so uh, so keep in mind, I'm untrained. I'm seven years old. I have seven years away from discovering jujitsu. Really, to di from discovering a way to, to hurt people is really what that was. And so uh, I'm with. I'm with, man, who am I with? I'm with my older brother. I, I'm i sure one of my parents was walking with us. And I want to say I was with this kid. He's like, he was like this kid from, he's like the first bully I ever dealt with, but he lived right next to my grandma. And so they were like, when, you know, when you're six and seven, your grandma's like, oh yeah, you guys can play. I'm like, grandma, this freaking jerk beats me up all the time. I don't want to play with him. And she's like, oh yeah, you guys are best friends. I'm like, I don't want to be his friend. He always claims that he's the white power ranger and I'm the white power ranger already. And he's like, oh no, I'm the white power ranger. And I'm like, okay, well, I'll be the red power ranger. And he'll be like, no, you can't be the red power ranger. You be the pink power ranger. And so... That was messed up, man. Or he would be like, oh, no, you be the yellow Power Ranger, which now is a little uh, is a little cooler because sometimes the yellow Power Ranger is a dude. But back then, when it was Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the yellow Power Ranger was a chick and she was Asian. And so now we painted this picture of this neighborhood boy. He's a racist, too. You know, like this dude, worse scum of the earth. OK. Just so you guys got the picture. He's really not even involved in this story. I just was thinking of who, who I had with me. But anyway, we are going, uh, we, we'd always go uh, trick-or-treating at my grandma's house, uh, just in her neighborhood. We grew up in a really rough place. And if somebody came to your house and knocked on your door where we lived, even on Halloween, you like, uh, you weren't going to answer it. It just wasn't the best place. So it wasn't the best place for us to trick-or-treat. We went to my grandma's. And uh, we're walking down, we're probably... 10 houses in having a grand old time and uh knock on this door all of a sudden this dude with some type i don't even remember i think it was like a wolf mask it was some really scary mask for a seven-year-old kid jumps out full scream on us freaks me out without a doubt still to this day the scaredest i have ever been in my life he Oh my gosh, I I probably cried for an hour. What was nice is the neighbor kid, he cried too. He was just as scared as me. So I was like, at least he suffered. So there was some redeeming quality to this. But still, it it was frustrating. I was upset about it. Uh, like still, honestly, to this day, this is, again, 100% true. Uh <laughs> This is terrible. I really do think like I have this, this like evil reoccurring daydream every once, every three, four months, or maybe sometime around Halloween season, where I think, okay, I know it's been 15 years. I don't know, 20 years. And I should be, I should be over this but I'm not. My grandma doesn't live in the same area. She hasn't in 15 years. So I haven't even seen that house in forever, but I still think about like, especially around this time. I wonder if I just went to my grandma's old house and just kind of like 
I knew the direction that this house was in. I don't remember exactly what house it was, um, but just see if there's anybody that is there doing that. And then what I would do is I would assume that that is the same person that that did it to me 20 years prior. And then what I would do is I would go with maybe one of my younger cousins or someone like that, somebody who's still trigger treats, who he would go to that house and he would jump out and I would full force as hard as I can punch him in the face. And I think about that to this day. I really think that the only lesson to to take from this is that Josh McKinney can hold an insane grudge. Gary Goleman, a comedian, he had this joke and a line that he said was, I have axes that I have been grinding since the second grade. And shoot, if this whole if this whole episode isn't been just about me talking about the axes that I've been grinding since the second grade, it, it, even, even this kid that was in the neighborhood with my grandma, I still think about like, man, I wonder if my grandma knows her neighbor still knows what she's up to, knows what her son's up to. And I could invite this kid to a jujitsu class and just beat him down. But see, what's messed up is once somebody comes to ju- ju- your jujitsu school, you're just used to immediately treating people nice. And it becomes weird when you're like, ah, oh, man, I can't get even with this guy anymore. So maybe I wouldn't invite him to jujitsu. Maybe I would just jump him in the street. That seems like a much more uh, respectful black belt move, right? Hey guys, I want to interrupt one more time and tell you about something really exciting that we have going on at simplifyingjujitsu.com. So right now for absolutely free, as it seems like everything that I want to do uh, is, I don't know why free content is my favorite content, but uh, I have a free book for you guys. It is an ebook. It is called The Three Lenses. And really, The Three Lenses is built around this idea that not everybody learns jujitsu in the same way. And what it does is it helps you learn how you specifically learn jujitsu, how other people learn jujitsu, and how you can use some of their habits and use your own to progress much faster simply by knowing how you enjoy learning. And so that book is absolutely free. It is only available at simplifyingjujitsu.com slash three. That is simplifyingjujitsu.com slash the number three. Let's get back to the episode. Yeah, I don't know. Speaking of, of me having axes that I've been grinding since the second grade keep in mind i'm still the same person as i was when i was that little kid too uh you know there's there is maybe i express these things in different ways um but yeah still the same guy when i was a kid these were some of the other i thought this was a really funny story to tell and this was probably even younger i'm probably five years old in this uh but my aunt got married uh and it, 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 she she was you know probably in her mid twenties and so all of her friends were in her mid their mid twenties and uh, my mom has uh, a few sisters and so uh, they're gonna be the bridesmaids and my mom has to walk down the aisle with this guy and I can't remember his name but I remember how I felt about him this dude was so freaking smug. I remember being five, six years old and me and my brother both being like, we're going to, we're going to fight this guy. Like this dude's 25. We're my brother's a little 13 year old or 12 year old. However old he is, he is very small for his age. And I'm five. Basically I'm a five-year-old body. And then you take my head now and stick that on a five-year-old body, right? Huge head for a kid. I can barely keep my balance, you know, and I'm going to, I am so sure. I remember even going from the wedding to the reception and the whole drive, just thinking like, we're going to mess Terry up when we see this dude, me and my brother, we're going to beat him down. And I also remember my mom being mad that we were doing that. And my dad 
secretly being happy and like congratulating us like, hey, that is how you guys should protect your mom. <laughs> that's that's how you guys should protect your mom. This is not a, I, I don't know why I'm just telling you guys random stories. This episode could just be totally terrible. I literally haven't referenced jujitsu yet. This is like an episode of of the Josh McKinney show, not the Isaka Jujutsu show. Uh, but anyway, this is this this kind of okay. We'll we'll go with a story that isn't uh, that isn't from childhood, but it also shows that I'm the same guy. Uh, so, like I said, my dad was proud of us secretly in secret. Like we had to keep it hush hush. But like, yeah, you know, hey, if if a guy is is like trying to be flirty with your mom or something, you guys should beat him down. That's just how it, that's how it be. My dad was never like, I, you know, there was, I, my dad never got in a fight when I was growing up, but there were just certain rules, certain things that certain rules you had to live by. Uh, I think his, I think his big rules were for us when we were kids, like don't fry bacon, bacon without a shirt on. Don't say I do unless you're the ugly one. And then uh, pretty much this, beat people up if they uh, look at or talk about your mom in any disrespectful way or any way that you could misconstrue to be disrespectful. And I will teach this lesson to my sons, I'm sure of it, whether I want to or not, because it just runs in me. So one time I was talking about how when somebody comes into your gym, you feel like you can't beat them up. Well, this was a specific situation. So one time this guy came into my gym and he had trained previously. It's not like there's this new white belt that I'm going to beat up. This guy is like, you know, he's trained for a long time. Okay. Uh, but he comes in, we're talking normal chat. I've never met this guy. And he says, yeah, you know, I actually know your wife. And I was like, okay, I don't, I don't see why you would even bring out I, already. I'm ready to beat this guy up, right? As I should be. Uh, and as you probably should be too, as you would be too. You know, if somebody said that, if somebody comes into your house and says your wife or your husband, oh yeah, you know, I, I know your wife or your husband, you're immediately, you're immediately mad about it, right? I don't know why that is. Maybe, maybe it is just me. Maybe that maybe you guys don't deal with that, but I do. But anyway, he says that he's like, Yeah, yeah, we went to school together. I'm like, okay, you want an award? And then this dude, I'm not kidding you. This is God honest truth. He had the audacity to say to me, how is she doing? As if, as if I'm not taking care of my wife. That's what it was like he was saying, right? How is she doing? She's doing, she's doing fine. And so then I beat the guy down. And, uh, uh, but it was in jujitsu. So it's, it's cool. You know, that's the beauty of jujitsu. You can beat somebody up and even be mean about beating them up. But as long as you're not too mean, they're still cool with it. They're just like, Hey, there's nothing I could have done about that. Whatever. You know, I probably shouldn't have asked how your wife was doing. Right. The audacity, right. You know, it's funny too. I told my wife this story later. She was of course mad as she should be. Right, that's what you're supposed to do when your significant other is uh, jealous. But it's also flattering, you know. You're also like, okay, I mean, it's good to know that if he actually should have beat that guy up, that he would have, you know. That's good to know. Um, but what's funny is later on that day, I'm telling that when we go to dinner with my family, and I'm telling that story at dinner. And I get to the point where I go, where I go, and he says, hey, how's Emily doing? And my brother, I'm not kidding, before I could even say the next word goes, she's doing just fine. What's that supposed to mean? And we we just died. We just laughed so hard because that was my response too. And, you know, it's kind of, uh, you know, it comes from the top down. It's weird how many how many little things you get from your your parents that are either <laughs> that are either good or bad or fun or funny or 
terrible, you know, uh, but yeah, it's really interesting. You also get those things from your jujitsu coach too. You know, I always think like when I start to, um, you know, when I start to really know something and I teach all my students it, there is this point where they take that knowledge and they're like, okay, this is truth, right? Or some of them do. This is truth. I love this. I'm going to think in this way and I'm going to teach this way and I'm going to do these things. And then maybe they go to a different gym or maybe they open their own school or maybe we just, we just never have a conversation about that position again. And maybe I start to develop that position much better. And I come up with new opinions and new ways to teach it and even new ways to play and strategize the position. My student may still just have what I originally gave them. And if they think about it as absolute truth, because it came from the mouth of Josh, you know, like, oh yeah, my coach said this, so this is true. They might miss out that I've developed something much better. But what I've also noticed is a lot of times, and I will uh, give some good jujitsu story examples about this now. Uh, a lot of times, I will show my student something. One of my students, especially that is open-minded and is getting better, right? Starting to learn on their own. And I'll show them that. And then six months later, we will both be in that same position, fighting it in a new way, but we'll both be doing the same thing. So we will have started at the same point of my knowledge saying, hey, this is where I think you should be. This is what I think you should do. And then they start to grow with that knowledge and get better with that knowledge. And I do too. But since we are kind of, you know, since we're uh, the, that coach student relationship where we have a lot of the same principles and a lot of the same values, we start to go, Hey, this armpit grip works a little better. This cross collar grip works a little better. Or maybe we just see each other doing it. We just notice, Oh, there's a little takeaway there but we end up developing together. And what's really cool about this, first time I ever noticed this stuff was, uh, I don't I don't know how much I've ever really told you guys about uh, like why I and John Thomas trained together for so long, but there's just a situation where uh, my dad was training him with weightlifting and um, John was in quotes doing a private lesson with me. And really what the private lesson was, was like three or four hours of both of us just drilling and breaking down positions and really uh, starting to kind of, for me, I was more the receiver of knowledge here, right? I was a blue belt and John's like a purple belt world champion. And so uh, I am getting a lot from him, right? But after a while, our ideas and a lot of our ideology started to match up. Not all of them, but a lot of them. And then what started to happen, which was really interesting, is a lot of the jujitsu we played started to match up because he was teaching me all this new stuff um, when technique wasn't just so easy to get like it is now. And so as we start to, you know, play both play spider guard, we both are playing knee cut and we're both watching the same guys. We're both going, Hey, if we're going to get good at the knee cut, uh, Leandro Lowe, so you should be watching. And then you should also be watching, um, Lucas Lapri, right? We both agreed on that. So we're watching the same guys, but then all of a sudden he moves back to Atlanta and then he moves from Atlanta to Sweden. So now we are separated by <laughs> the, I, the ocean, like we, we have a very big distance between us. We really don't talk regularly. Uh, my dad and John did at the time still do, I think. Um, but I just, you know, I don't talk to a ton of people regularly. Right. Um, but we don't really get to talk regularly. We don't talk about jujitsu hardly ever, but every couple of years we would get together. And what was really interesting is every couple of years we would get together and we would be still on very similar paths. We would still be doing like the, like we would both be doing brand new stuff, but we would both be doing the same brand new stuff. Even to when uh, uh, I got my black belt, this is the first time that John and I are both black belts. 
Uh, and so uh, that time that he came, this was like two times ago, three times ago, he came and uh, uh, taught at my gym. We both were never leg lock guys. We both were like, hey, straight ankle is the way to go. And had never had that conversation. And I wasn't watching him teach straight ankle stuff. There was no reason that both of us should have been on that same train. But we were watching the same guys. We're having the same values. And we also started kind of from that same point. And this will happen so often when you when you have a uh, you know when you have a good coach when you have a good relationship with your coach you'll see this a lot but what will cause this to stop happening is if you or your coach believes in this idea of these this absolute truth in jujitsu to me there just isn't like there is not a perfect way to do a knee cut to me. Because the great knee cut guys do the knee cut a thousand different ways. And it's based on really, really specific reactions. And I think the best way to learn what that is to is to have a simple way to understand it. To say, what are these guys actually thinking about when they're making all these minor adjustments? Where is their body position actually at when they're making these minor adjustments? Right? But if I go and say, well, this guy won a world title with a knee cut and he posted a free YouTube video on how to knee cut. And now I am 100% sure that that is the only way you should be knee cutting. And I am guilty of this. I've done this a million times with a million different moves while I was coming up in the ranks. And I slowly stopped because every time I would think I had it figured out, somebody would throw a wrench in it and it would destroy my whole idea would destroy my whole plan and what i would do a lot of the times is i would go how can i figure out a way to counter what he is doing right um when i'm trying to knee cut and he lassos how do i figure out a way well what did the guys that i'm watching do to this lasso right instead sometimes it's easier to go hey maybe i should back away from knee cutting a little bit maybe i shouldn't think of it as the only thing Maybe I should start to work something else. Maybe I, I could even just think a little bit differently about the knee cut and stop thinking that I had it all figured out from this one video, right? Or even the best coaches in the world, even the best explainers in the world, even something you hear, even something you hear from me, it's not absolute truth. It is my opinion in the specific moment, the specific situation. If you guys made me... Five years from now, you said, hey, you're going to redo every solo episode of the I Suck at Jiu-Jitsu show. You're going to like write a new outline for each of them and deliver that content. But they'll all the topic will be the same each time, um, you know, for each episode. And you're going to redo them. I guarantee you that I will. it will sound totally different. The way I explain things will sound totally different. There will be certain things that I told you guys previously that I don't even agree with anymore. Does that mean I was just like absolutely wrong five years before? No, it was helpful for you, right? It was the reason that you listened to the show. That's how we should be thinking about jujitsu technique, in my opinion, of course. That's how we should think about learning new things in jujitsu. These things are good and they can help me overall but they're not perfect. Nothing in jujitsu is just this perfection. And so thinking that way of like, okay, it's perfect. It starts to make you over dwell on like really specific things in jujitsu. When you watch somebody good who plays a lot of different positions and then you try to ask them, hey, what did you do there? Most of the time, They'll go, um, where? And you'll go, oh, th 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 that position. And they'll go, well, let me feel it. And then they'll put you there and then they'll immediately know. It's because they're not thinking as a technician. They're not thinking in techniques. They're not going, hey, what technique do I know from here? They're going, or is there even a perfect technique from here? They're going, 
I am a grappler in a certain situation. I am going to see if I can grapple my way out of it, right? It's weird, this this idea that what you know in a sense of techniques is like what matters. It seems to be like, no, everyone agrees with me when I say this. Like, oh yeah, it doesn't matter how many techniques you know. Everybody agrees with me. But then they go back to only focusing on what techniques they know. That's all it is about. Instead of, hey, is there an easier way to understand what I'm trying to accomplish? Is there an easier way to understand this fight? Is there a way to just get better at this specific fight that I'm trying to get better at? And a lot of times the answer is yes. Great reference for the designated winner episode right there. If you guys want it. Oh, shoot. I don't remember. I think it's episode 129 if I had to guess, but I'll link it in the description regardless. Um, but uh, yeah, that's a great way to get better at any specific skill in jujitsu. Uh, shoot. I told all the stories that I had to tell you guys. Let me see. That, see is there anything else that would be a solid story to reference? We talked Halloween. We talked... Yeah, we talked how much I uh, think you should beat people up for asking how your wife is doing. Man, we talked about a lot of good stuff. This episode is this episode is just too Josh McKinney. I don't know how I feel about posting this one. But I really don't have time to record another one, so I guess I'm going to post this one. I guess there's really no other choice. Uh, yeah, I think that's all I have for you guys. Thank you guys for listening to... The ramblings of a madman. Uh, hope you guys maybe found this helpful. If not, hope you found it funny and fun, and uh, hope you enjoyed it. And that is the episode. Thank you guys for watching this one, listening to this one, hearing it. I wonder how many people listen to it all the way through i wonder if there was if there were people that like did not take the disclaimer at the beginning seriously and we're like oh no i feel like this episode is going to have a lot to do with jujitsu it's like no it doesn't it doesn't have anything to do with jujitsu at all but it was fun uh like i said if you guys enjoyed this one i really you know doing one that's this different never done one with a topic like this or no topic like this uh but yeah doing doing these and just trying to experiment with some stuff because uh i promise you guys consistent one episode a week last year at the beginning of the year and we are almost through 10 months and have not missed a week of posting and i've done uh, every single thursday posting an episode and so next year i think i'm gonna do uh more than that or just to some extent i don't know what i'm gonna do for sure next year um but i just want to hear more from you guys i just want to hear more opinion on what you guys are liking so just anytime between now and the end of the year if you could just send me a message tell me what you like on the show um this could be at my email josh at simplifyingjujitsu.com or on instagram at the josh mckinney but just let me know what you're enjoying on the podcast because I would like to give you guys more of it. Uh, it's awesome that the reviews that I get are positive. Uh, and so I just want to hear what part of the show you guys are enjoying. And uh, I want to turn the volume up on that part. All right. And so, yeah, that's all I have for you guys today. Uh, thank you guys for listening to this one. I hope you guys liked today's episode. Hope you guys give me that five star review. And most importantly, I don't know if it was possible or not, but I hope today's episode helps you guys suck just a little bit less at jujitsu. Have a great day, guys.